So now we look at displacement uh, more in a polar uh, domain, a polar coordinate system. So displacement, um, like we've seen before, um, is not the same as distance. So in this case, we have displacement of an object defined as the change in the position vector. And you'll notice that the definition has changed a little bit. Instead of being x sub f minus x sub i, it is now a change in what is really a radius, the radius of the final minus the radius of the initial. And we can see that um, in the diagram here where, <clears throat> where we've got a curve um, that is shown. And we've got this radial um, displacement or this radial point going out from the origin out to some point on the line. In this case, radius initial um, at some time initial and then radius final at some time final at point P and point Q. So we're looking at uh, a projectile or a particle really moving along a path and us being able to track where that particle is based upon a radius and a time and a point in space. So at some point P at a time T initial the position of the particle is described by the position vector. Now this is this is a, a, a polar relationship now uh, out to a radius r sub i. And likewise at some point q at a time t sub f or t final, uh, its position then is described by this vector r sub f. So the final position vector then is the sum of the initial position vector and its change in the radius. So all along here, if we were to infinitesimally divide this up, we would have a change in radius from here to here. Now we can define angular velocity using our polar relationship. The average velocity of a particle during the time interval delta t is the ratio then of the displacement to the time interval for this displacement. So we've got some average velocity. Again, v with a little hat on top with a little line is defined. The three lines means it's defined. It's not equal to. It's defined as the change in the radius divided by the change in time, delta r by delta t. Contrasting that, an instantaneous velocity then is defined as the limit. So we go back to this limit concept. Again, this is our, our introduction, if you will, to calculus, differential calculus. The limit of the average velocity, delta r by delta t, as we reduce our time down to zero. Remember, we cut it down, we cut it down, we cut it down until we essentially get a snapshot in time. <coughs> so we have the instantaneous velocity, v with no hat, defined as the limit as the time delta t approaches zero for the change in r over the change in t. Next, we look at the definition then for the average acceleration. The average acceleration then of an object whose velocity changes by the change in velocity delta v in a time interval, again, delta t, is a vector defined as the ratio of delta v over delta t. Again, it's defined that way. The instantaneous acceleration then follows the same suit, is defined then as the limit of the average acceleration vector as the time goes to zero. So we've got the same limit relationship. In looking at um, what goes on in two dimensions, some assumptions. The free fall acceleration, gravity, we use little g. When we're talking about acceleration, which is usually throwing a ball or shooting a gun or whatever, we use a. But if we're talking about the free fall acceleration of something that uh, you know is falling due to gravity, I'm looking to see what I've got here. I'll just use this. You know, this, all of the acceleration here is the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so that's our gravity relationship. 
and it's constant over the entire range of motion and it's always directed down. In our problems, unless they tell you something different, generally speaking, the effect of air resistance will become negligible because the air resistance is going to change with time uh, for the amount of time that the object is actually moving through space and being resisted by uh, air moving at the acceleration of gravity. And we also say the rotation of the Earth does not affect the motion. So if we look at plotting a path of a projectile, the path of the projectile in this case is is curved. So let's let's say that there's somebody standing at the origin and they throw a ball up and out. It's going to follow this path and then land at some distance in the X direction or along the horizon. So you notice here that we've got all of these components superimposed on the path of the projectile which follows in essence a parabola. And you'll notice that for the upward path, we've got components in the positive direction. The velocity in the y direction, initial, the velocity in the x direction, initial, and some angle. Okay, and it, we end up with a velocity that as the, let's, let's say it's a, a baseball uh, or a bullet is flying in this path, what is going to happen is that the velocity from here to here is going to change. And you'll notice at the peak of the parabola, all of the y component is gone. There's no more upward velocity. We only have the velocity in the x direction driving the bullet, if you will, downrange. And then, in this case, we're fighting against gravity as the ball is going up or the bullet is going up. Once it reaches that point, in essence, that's a snapshot in time where the object is, notice the velocity zero, okay, in the y direction. Now the velocity is going to start to pick up in the y direction, but it's going to be in the negative direction. And it's because it's as a result of the gravity. As gravity is pulling the bullet down, it's going to speed up and it's going to speed up until it hits some terminal velocity and hits the ground. Without the effect of, of uh, air resistance and uh, any other effects, the velocity at this point will become terminal velocity for a bullet and the bullet hits ground. Uh, this should give you a very good idea in thinking in terms of celebratory gunfire. With celebratory gunfire, you shoot up in the air and, and, and out. Um, the bullet is going to return to the ground at a little less than the initial velocity in the Y direction, okay? Uh, because in this case, real world, you have the effect of uh, wind resistance friction. So in projectile problems, they can be solved easily if air friction is ignored. One simply considers the motion to consist of the two independent parts, X and Y. The horizontal motion with an initial acceleration of zero and a final velocity to equal the initial velocity, and we call it V, for a constant velocity problem. And our vertical motion then, with the acceleration equal to the acceleration of gravity, equal to 9.8 meters per second squared downward. In choosing and working these types of problems, you want to choose a coordinate system so that the Y direction is vertical and positive upward. In this case, the acceleration then in the y direction as an object is moving up is the gravity is negative, so a negative g. Just as in the free fall, the acceleration in the x direction is zero because air resistance is considered negligible. Another term, velocity vector. If the velocity vector makes an angle of, of theta zero, with the horizontal, where theta zero is called the projection angle, then from the definitions of sine and cosine, we have, and we, you can see, we go right back to our terms here that we saw in our example. The velocity initial in the x direction is equal to velocity initial cosine theta, 
and the same thing for the y component. Okay, v y initial equal to v naught sine theta. So the equations that become important in doing these types of problems, again, write these down in your notebook, that is when solving for displacement or a distance, x v sub x naught times t, if we're solving for a velocity in the y direction, v y initial minus gravity times time, if we're, if we're looking at a distance in the y direction, vy naught minus one half gravity times squared. And if we're looking for um, velocity squared in the y direction, we have vy naught initial squared minus g and y. Okay, so let's go ahead and stop this one here and we'll come back and uh, work a couple of uh, projectile motion problems so we can discuss it.